Good evening. Welcome to this episode for Prophecy for the uh, final hour. And again, I, did, I wanted to say last hour. We are in the last hour, but whatever. Uh, yes, this episode I'm going to pick up sort of again where I left off last week. I'm doing a teaching on, I don't really, on, on some of the deeper understandings, the mysteries, and a lot of my confirmations now is coming from the Zohar. And I want to explain what that is. Uh, I'm going to start with a verse out of Romans. Uh, but I do want to um, make a couple of disclaimers to begin. I'd just like to say again, Enoch is one of the patriarchs. Enoch is probably one of the greatest uh, patriarchs, uh, especially before the flood. And he wrote the book Enoch. And uh, at one point it says it was 365 books. The ancient world, as we've come to understand through better research, was filled with Enochian literature, meaning the information that Enoch received about the whole cosmos was unbelievable. And, uh, and it wasn't reserved just to the Jews, because again, he was pre-Diluvian. This knowledge, this understanding was used for the righteous and the unrighteous uh, for many, many ages, the Alexandrian fire uh, in, I think, around 300 AD uh, burned most of the last of the text. And if it wasn't for us today, again, for the Ethiopian church having keeping text, actually uh, text in their uh, canon, in their libraries, we wouldn't have it today, but we do. And it was also found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is information that's coming back to us. And I this is what I want to say. I have been, you know, just flat out studying the Word of God uh, for years on levels that, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm just compelled, okay, to just do nothing really but study the Word and occupy painting or whatever I have to do in the physical until he comes. But Enoch made a, it, the first verse in the book of Enoch kind of sums it up because we... It's, and I'll just read it to you, a couple of verses from the first chapter of Enoch. It kind of lays the foundation that the eternal God, I'm sorry to quote, will tread upon the earth and Mount Sinai and appear from his camp in the strength of his, from heaven. Of, but see, the translations now, I want to say, as I understand, because part of our problem is the translations are so misleading at this point. And I'm not putting any blame game, it's just that it's like a game of telephone. It's been going on for so long now. But it's coming back, understandings are coming back. But anyways, he will appear in the strength with the armies, with his armies from heaven, because the word might refers is the word armies, referencing Jeff, Genesis. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watcher shall quake. Now people understand, the watcher and there's a whole class of really uh, some of the problem entities in the cosmos with great fear and trembling. But with the righteous, because there's, a, there's two sides to this coin, with the righteous he will make peace. He will protect the elect and have mercy upon them. And behold, he comes with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones, and again, thousands upon, that's the word myriads, that's a word that's like a mathematical word that means, you can't really count them, a thousand times a thousand, how many is that? Square, cubit, whatever you want to do to it. It's an innumerable, some of the translations will say an innumerable multitude, um, to execute judgment upon all, uh, to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works, their ungodly works, and of the ungodly things that they have spoken against um, Yahweh Elohim. That's the basic. So what you have to see is there is an end game. You're not going, there always was an end game. It's 6,000 years. But now I want to go to this point with Paul. Because as I delve into the Zohar, I want to build a basis of what my sure foundation, because now I really feel, and I'm pretty confident, I have landed on a sure foundation. I, I have no more um, trepidation about what I teach or speak or say. I really do. I'm on a firm foundation, as Paul said, and I'm building, which is now I understand the mysteries, which, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. The sages, the Zohar, it's all there. So I'm not <laughs> 
not teaching anything new. I'm not discovering writing anything. It's all there. But the understanding of our sages is that there's a 6,000 year window to this whole thing be from the time of the fall to the judgment to the final judgment when the ungodly will be removed and it's broken down into three parts basically the patriarchs the torah and the messiah two days two days and two days and this understanding helps you unravel some of the words and some of the phraseologies that are in the bible um but the patriarchs is from abraham and before and you go all the way back well you could start with adam and to seth and to no, Methuselah and Noah, and you go on to Enoch and or, you know Noah and Shem and Abraham. I've done teachings on that. Okay, that's that was a bloodline, a righteous bloodline in the earth. Then you go to the Torah, where a time of two thousand years, where the whole nation of Israel and the time of the twelve tribes, the United Kingdom, the divided kingdom, whatever, uh, and the Torah, the law, and an understanding in a, with a temple at its center, what that represented, what God was doing. And then you have our two days we've been living in, which is called the, uh, the two days of the Messiah. In his, we understand now in his first coming as Messiah ben Joseph for the lost sheep of the house of Israel and for those in the mixed multitude, the door, was, this is what Paul saw, that the door was flown, flown wide open for anyone, anyone could come in. Now, let me... Uh, read a quote from Paul, Romans chapter 9, uh, verse, uh, God, this is small print here, even with my glasses, verse, uh, verse 3, he says, he's talking about um, the people of his own race. Okay, now I've also unlocked back this word. He's not talking about like race of mankind. He's talking, this word is a bad translation. It's talking about his his really close genetic kinfolks type, house of Judah type, of the Benjamites, uh, Judah, the, house, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and a lot of the Levites who had stayed loyal to all the temple uh, services that were going on. And basically that's what was making up the um, southern house. And it's, it's always a two and a ten dichotomy with a little bit of mixed sifting going on or, you know, whatever. Um, so he's a, and Paul is a Benjamite. So he's talking about his house of Judah people, okay, which in the parable, somebody, again, of the, uh, the prodigal son, which is a, again, that's a Jewish parable. That's not a Gentile parable. That's a Jewish parable. Um, the older son is Judah, okay, who has stayed in the house. And this is important because theirs, okay, house of Judah, who actually, St they got a certain part of the birthright with the scepter. They kept the bloodline, and this is also what they kept. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the, the covenants. This is home, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. It is, and it is, okay, so this is important to understand. I'm not going to break this down, but you, there's different things in this whole mix. I always say that history, especially the 6,000 years, is this his, H-I-S, story, his story, how he is working salvation through the nations. Because he goes on to say here, and it is not as though God's words had failed. Oh, Christian, I tell you today, God's word is so true. It is. It has come to pass, and it is coming to pass in an unbelievably accurate way. We just... We just don't understand. <laughs> My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It says that not, but not all Israel, but not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And that's a key understanding right there. Not because they're just descendants are they Abraham's children. Uh, are they all Abraham's children? On the contrary, it is through Isaac that their seed will be reckoned. And that's a whole huge thing that we have to unpack. But I, you have to understand here that you have divine glory, which is the word doxa, which is, I'm going to get into this. Theirs is the covenants, okay? I mean, God made covenant with Adam. He made covenant with, um, with Noah. He made covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant. He renewed the covenant with Isaac and Jacob. He made a covenant with Moses, with the whole people of Israel. The covenants, it's plural. We have to understand what's going on in this whole thing. The receiving of the law, the Torah. And I have to say this, the Torah does not mean, Christian, we are not under the law, who love to throw through, oh, we're not under the law, you have no idea what you're talking about. The Torah is a word used to represent the righteous laws of God. God has righteous 
it, and, and law is sort of sometimes like about what it, a decrees or ways in which he wants his creation to function together in unity, okay? This is important because it predates the Torah uh, and, it, and it will go on after the, even these 6,000 years. God is a, is a God of order. His, he, the law is part of him. He has righteous ways. That's when he created it. He said it is good. He's the one who gets to say how this thing functions. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say. He's the one who sets the laws of, of, of motion and the laws of gravity and the laws of creation and what can and cannot be combined and the secret, all this kind of stuff, okay? Um, the temple worship, which is what they, when he instituted the nation of Israel and Moses and they made a tabernacle in the wilderness and all this thing, as above, so below, what were they exemplifying? What understanding did these uh, priests, did God give to them in the oral Torah? That I'm going to come back to, and the promises, okay, the patriarchs. So we have to understand, there's a lot, so this is what's important. While the world has a lot of truth, it is in the house of Judah, we owe them. That's why they will inherit along with, when all Israel is reunited, why Ephraim uh, should not be jealous of Judah and vice versa. They two have two houses have been doing something very specific and very important in the salvation of the world. But the Zohar is in here in the temple worship and the pro part of this, the oral Torah, is, is a lot of the understanding that had been, has been esoteric knowledge that is part of this whole thing that was really kept very close to the remnant, the righteous remnant from, and this, you know, that a, lo, a knowledge of the, of the cosmos that was supposed to be preserved but was not supposed to be fully known like by the whole world, so to speak, yet, until we get to the end of the age. This is the understanding, the illumination, the enlightenment. This is part of what the elect, their job in the last days is to bring forward, a complete and full open book understanding of what has been going on behind the veil. The Lord did it the first time. Yahushua did it the first time um, in his coming. He said he made a display openly of them. And but we've lost it again, okay? And this last time when we get it back, we're coming out of exile. For, we're just never, it's never going to get lost again, okay? So, but the Zohar, when I did find out and realize that much of what I was seeing in the Word and understanding, this whole idea that it's encrypted, and I'll tell you a little secret, they have encrypted, oh my gosh, it makes your, it makes your brain hurt <laughs> to try to figure out. Um... And now it's going to be so much easier when I finally realized that what I was looking at, searching at, being shown by the Holy Spirit is really the hidden wisdom, the oral tour, the mysteries that have been reserved uh, for the last days, and it is in the Zohar. Now, nothing's perfect or pure in this level. I'm not, we're not talking, I mean, there's translation, there's all this stuff that has to be, you know, uh, but that's a foundation. A lot of cultures out there, a lot of people groups, a lot of truth is out there. But this is why God tells Israel, if you'll just, you know, to the older brother, you know, you've always been with me. Why are you upset if I, you know, welcome back the prodigal here? You're always with me. I have plenty of blessings. Believe me, you're going to get your reward. You know, you're going to. So these help to understand what's at stake and what's going on. And that, that, that all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Just because, you know, just because you're born into a Christian home, per se, doesn't mean you're going to turn out to really. Free will is a very big determining factor. So that being said, um, I want to now, because I'm also going to unlock something that Paul says next, in, and hopefully I'm going to end there, oh my gosh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 38. But what I have been understanding, is, I wish I had my chart. I didn't have my chart this week. Because I'm beginning to unpack this concept of what's called the tree of life, the sephirate. Um, this diagram that you can find that is part of, a lot of it is, comes out of Kabbalah. Now let me say this last disclaimer too. Kabbalah, Jewish Kabbalah that is passed down for our sages, okay, because I consider myself part of the righteous. I've been grafted into this righteous line. So these are my patriarchs now. This is my, um, the truth that I 
can lay claim to. Uh, this understanding, the oral Torah that was passed down, um, they have the, the, the seraphit, it's just a diagram, but it's like the tree of life. Okay, there's have all these, and this is what I've been understanding. The deception, how does it phrase it, that there will be a, a delusion that the whole earth is going to be under. By the time Jesus, the Lord comes back in the second coming, it says that all are going to be under the power of the wicked one, and there's going to be a huge delusion. Well, this has been in the works for thousands of years, okay? And Satan, who will finally, but who is Satan? Okay, this is the point. In these deep works, we can get an understanding of who the players are, what's been going on on a much, much deeper level. And this will help us to have an answer for a lot of uh, the new age, they call it the new age, but a lot of this understanding, see, because a lot of this understanding is getting reintroduced back to us, oh my gosh. But they're leaving out one important detail in the seraphim, because I said, at the top you have a crown, you have a couture, that's where the Most High God is, and you have um, Bina and Wisdom, or Hulkma and Bina, the Godhead. Okay, you have the Godhead in the verse three little circles. That's the Godhead. And unfortunately, what Satan has done is he's trying to represent all the information on the cosmos on all the bottom seven seraphim, but not tell you <laughs> that the whole thing is really orchestrated from the top. Does that make sense? Because that's really um, what it means to turn everything upside down. Okay, now. I've been talking about the trees in the garden. I've done a couple of teachings on this because, and last week, okay, so last week I talked about, lo and behold, this girl comes out of Afghanistan who wins the Nobel Peace Prize. Her name is Malala Yosefzai, Yosef Zai. okay, and her name, lo and behold, means, uh, Sons, she's part of a clan, a tribe, sons of Joseph. Well, it turns out Yosef is Joseph. <laughs> she is part, and these people claim their lineage all the way back to the ten northern tribes, to the tribes of Joseph that were dispersed in the first dispersion. Now, I don't think that's an ac accident. I think that's absolutely accurate. Because, see, this helps us to understand. When you understand what happened in the garden, the two trees, the apple, all this symbolism, which is symbolic language for extremely deep and spiritual realities with boots on the ground, okay? Wait a minute why genealogies were so important in the first two, the first four days. The years of the patriarchs, when it was a bloodline going through, a righteous bloodline, and in the days of the Torah or of the nation of Israel, when they had, when it was the nation was to keep uh, a pure bloodline. Because up until the Messiah came, this is, that's why genealogies, and why were genealogies so important? So I've unpacked with the two trees, and a lot of people are unpacking this. This is the whole concept. Uh, and, when, and when I get into Paul, if I get into 1 Corinthians 38 uh, tonight, I can explain all this. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 38 and on. And this is what is explained in the Zohar. And when Paul says, present your body, your soul, and your spirit blameless to the covenant. We are a threefold being. We have a body which is made up of material, materiality. This is the word flesh. This is the word, and there's another even word, soma, the body, the flesh, the carnal, things below, things in the world of matter, things that we can taste, touch, see, and hear. And when it refers to a person, it is your soma, your body, your physicality, your materiality. Okay? Now, there's also a soul. The middle part of the sephirot, and even this is also... Uh, refers to the soul of man, okay? And the highest part refers to the breath, um, to the Godhead part, okay? When God breathed into Adam, he breathed into him. And listen, people, it was just a breath. <laughs> you know, one breath. He breathed, which, okay. And Adam, a part of the Godhead in the sense of wit. And remember the Godhead in its purest sense because God is not a man. He is a spirit. He is of an essence that is pure, holy, true light. It is 
Uh, so he breathed that into Adam, part of himself, okay? And that filtered down into his soul life, that filtered down into the material. Okay, this is when they're saying, let me just say this on other thing, if you just kind of check it in with me. And the concept with the Zohar, with the, with the Seraphit, the tree of life, this tree of life and the Seraphit are kind of synonymous for the same thing. Okay, and the, this is an ancient, ancient, every culture you'll see the tree of life images. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient archetype of what's going on. The tree of life is, what, what is what's trying to explain this whole cosmos. Okay, and I'm using the word cosmos because this is the foundational understanding that we have that what we can know about God, we can know. It is revealed, and that is the whole cosmos. What's beyond it, like I said, what's on the eighth day, we can't really figure out. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, what God has prepared for those. What went on before and soft, and that's how he's doing. Um, in, in the beginning, God created. So those two, who knows? Whatever. I will never speculate there. In fact, I know, I'm, but the praise God, I know I'm going towards the eighth day. <laughs> I'm going... Okay, but what's in this sphere? And you can call it an egg. You can, you know, and actually, the, it has great mathematical proportion. I mean, it, this is what's so fascinating about this, and I can't even. Vibration, voice, and light waves, the whole thing is extremely physics. I mean, it is, the ancients had so much information that we're just beginning to discover with quantum physics and all this stuff, and we think we're so cool, and, you know, we've gone to the, quote, unquote, <laughs> we've gone to the moon or whatever. Uh, we can fly airplanes. We can, we, can, we can do amazing things, but it is really nothing, I have to tell you this, in compared to what the ancients could do, okay? Even by, especially by their own literature, because I do think at this point that mythology is way truer, way truer in what, in an explanation of how, what was going on in the cosmos versus evolution were coming from apes. You know, as a little kid, I never believed that. I just never, I was just, when they teachers would teach me that in school, I'm like looking at them like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, like, even then I knew that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. <laughs> but anyways, okay. So here, and I, this is what I want to get at, because this, you have to understand how this thing works. There is a materiality. There is matter. This is what they understand today with strength. But there is a whole world of forces out there. You can't see them, but they're there, and they function, and they operate. We know the moon is out there, and it, it exerts forces on the earth. We have huge tide swings every 12 hours, every 6 hours. This is, okay, so this is a fact. Okay, so, and, you know, scientists spend their whole trying to figure this out. Well, the ancients also lived in the material we're trying to figure it out, and they had tremendous insight and wisdom, especially Adam. This is the whole point when God breathed into him, when he was able to name everything in the cosmos. He could have a conversation with God, and they could talk, and he had... The highest level, Bina and Chokma, of understanding and wisdom, he had the highest level of understanding, okay? And he got this because, you know, God had breathed into him some of his mind, his, 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 in his image, okay? Now, the concept of the cosmic tree, I just want to get back to this, okay? So you have a top, you have, I call it the Morning Star Administration, okay? You have the middle part, which is really kind of five circles, the, uh, the seraphim, which is the soul part, which is the heavens, which is a lot of this. The heavens, and I want to get in, the heavens and the soul are completely, uh, so, it's, so it's really like this computer programming. Because these were all just really complex computer programs. There's really the whole, if you're going to do it, I've done the simulation, if you're going to do a whole, it, the best thing now, you, it, it, it's all computer simulations. The, the soul the stars really do run and regulate the soul part of man and, and of all creatures, okay? The world of materiality, the physical, and then the, I have to tell you one more thing. Because <laughs> uh, this is, oh, well, let me just stick with the world tree. Let me just get this out, okay? Oh, I'm so bad. Because we, we have to understand these archetypes. A tree, because this is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. 
This is the whole point. This is what he's seeing. This is this this thing has played itself out many times in the scriptures. He's, so if you don't know what they're talking about, you're just making up interpretations. Um, a tree, by definition, has branches, it has a trunk, and it has roots in its most simplistic form. Uh, the branches, or let's just stick with the trunk, okay? The trunk is a part of it, that you, a torso which you can see, which is uh, the branches usually are referred to the heavens. What's things, okay? So Paul makes a statement. He says things in heaven, things, and he, I think he says even the high heavens, the heavens, things on the earth, and things under the earth. And she says, what's the guy talking about? And I've unpacked this a little bit, too, especially the under the earth stuff. We have no problem with things on the earth, right? We have no problem with things in the heavens, because star, whatever. Okay. Um, this is, the trunk represents the things that are on the earth and in the very short heavens that we can really kind of see. And our, our sun, our moon, our planets, these are the things, okay? They know there's stuff out there that even we can't see yet. And under the earth, the, the root system, okay? These are very important phraseologies we use to describe dimensions that are there and a couple, a couple we can't see. So the things that are under the earth, and this is why people, what trips people up, uh, the root systems, this is really where the, the seas, okay, biblically the word seas refers to this whole dimension, dimensions, okay, that are under the earth, okay? And this is, we know, and this is in Hebrews, if you've done any study, you understand, your Bible's full of it, well, you got the earth, but then you got, you know, shale and Tartarus and Hades, there's all these levels down there. The abyss is like the way, way down is furthest point, the densest, the darkest, the blackest, these are all, and that's actually where Zenoch was referring to, the watchers shall quake. The watchers, on the day of judgment, they are really in deep doo-doo. <laughs> uh, that's where he's, in Genesis 6, he sent the watcher angels who cohabited with creating the race of giants and that whole, like, history on the planet. Uh, you have then you have a lot of other dimensional entities, things that are going on closer up to the surface of the earth. This is what people, and this is what's really interesting, people, because I have to tell you something. You know, you think that you're, uh, you know, all this stuff is new and Ghostbusters out there, and they think they're starting to get in contact with other dimensional entities, and oh yeah, ghosts, and you know, it's kind of stuff. Nothing new under the sun, nothing, 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 nothing. This is all just getting a grip on beginning to understand the different dimensional spheres where other things are going on. Entities like and, and there entities and life forms and there are programs running. Okay. So the tree is a sort of a uh, a, a way to kind of simplify this whole concept. Okay. Now this is what is really important to understand about this. Okay, so now I gotta, I'm, I'm just going to be able to get to this first point. <laughs> the trees in the Garden of Eden, because we're a body and we're a soul, when you really study out Genesis 1, you'll, and I think it's into 2 and 3, you'll understand that there's like two things going on. They call it the two falls of Adam. It seems to be describing two different falls or different events with Adam, what went on with Adam and Eve, is they're kind of descending down and down and down into this level of what is really materiality, and they're being clothed with skin. They're actually being, I mean, this whole thing.